Hi everybody, it's Amy from Winterwood Studio and today I'm finally doing my Color Theory 101 video. Right, the video I had originally planned to go up tomorrow Sunday crashed and burned, so it's Saturday morning and I had this one planned out already, so we're going to see if I can do it and edit it and get it up in time for tomorrow morning. So come on in and let's get talking about color. Okay, so the way that most artists use Color Theory well, I shouldn't say that. The way most beginner artists use color theory is strictly as a way to pick a palette for their painting. So they'll pick a few colors and do their painting in those colors, and that's about it. Um, and that's a great way to use color theory, but that is really beginner color theory. So we're going to get a little bit deeper than that today, and we're going to talk about color theory and how we use it as artists. So the first thing we're going to do is look at this color wheel, and I'm going to shock all of you and tell you that this color wheel is actually wrong. This is a Newton color wheel, and it was invented in 1704 by Isaac Newton, and he stated that the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And for most beginner artists, they still consider red, yellow, and blue to be the primaries. Primary colors are called primary colors because you're not supposed to be able to mix them from any other colors that you have. But now I'm going to show you something that is going to blow your mind. <laughs> All right, so let's see, do I have, here's my palette here. Let's wet our quinacridone magenta, and we'll put that here. So we've got our bright violety pink magenta here, and let's see what happens when we add some yellow. And let's add a little bit more magenta. Let's see here, what color are we getting here? Hmm, that's looking very red, isn't it? A cool red because we used a cool magenta and a cool yellow. Let's add a little bit more yellow. I don't want to take it so far that it turns orange. That's pretty red though there, isn't it? So we, what just happened here? We just mixed red with, here's our scarlet. Let's just put that over here to compare. This is scarlet, which is supposed to be a pure red. And then we'll put our crimson, which is supposed to be a cool pure red. So we're pretty close to both of those colors in about five seconds of mixing. If I tried harder, I could match those two reds exactly. Why? Why can I do that? I thought red was a primary. I'm not supposed to be able to mix red, right? That's because this color wheel is wrong. The primaries are actually yellow. Yellow is always a primary, and you're, just in case you didn't know, you're supposed to hold your color wheel with the yellow at the 12 o'clock position. And then the other primaries, other than yellow, are going to be your magenta and your cyan. Cyan is the other primary color. It's yellow, magenta, and cyan. This wheel, like I said, is wrong. This is a Newton color wheel, Newtonian color wheel. An interesting fact is that left-handed, high IQ male individuals tend to have a slight tendency toward colorblindness. Newton <laughs> was a left-handed, high IQ individual, and there have been some people who think that he had some slight colorblindness as well. <laughs> So we're using a color wheel that was invented by a man that probably had some mild color blindness. Um, and interestingly enough, he also at one point had notes, like musical notes, associated with each one of the colors on the color wheel. And he would pick his clothes for the day using musical chords so that he knew he didn't clash. But yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's interesting. But technically, this wheel is wrong. Um... If you're going to get a color wheel, if you don't have one already, I would highly suggest you get a CYM or cyan yellow magenta color wheel and not a Newton color wheel. Okay, so now that we know that the color wheel is wrong and that the primaries are actually magenta, red, and cyan, we can move forward and talk about primaries versus secondaries. So secondaries are the colors that you can mix with your primary colors. And I'm not going to get too confusing, but you know, your, your basic colors then are yellow, magenta, and cyan, and orange, red, and blue. So those are your colors, your primaries and secondaries, and it's a little bit confusing when you start talking about mixing colors and your base of colors is now wrong. You've got the cyan, magenta, and yellow. Just to prove my point, if you think about your printer, your home printer, 
What are the colors of inks in there? They're going to be cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, or CYMK. K is the black. That's what's in your printer. When you print a realistic photo with your printer, it's using only those inks to create all the colors that you see on your photo that prints out. Uh, the only case where CYMK is not the actual, or CYM is not the actual color wheel, is if you are working in light. So, yes, the stage, if you're using, if you're running like a theater, they use uh, red, green, and blue filters to make their lights on the stage. Red, green, and blue and light equals white. If you put all three of those together, that equals white. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about this to you. Well, are you a digital artist? <laughs> if you're a digital artist, you're essentially painting with light on your backlit screen or iPad or uh, Wacom screen tablet or whatever you're using. If it's like an Intuos that doesn't, Intuos that doesn't have a screen, then you're using your computer monitor and you're using light. So for you, you're going to have different <laughs> primaries to make it even more confusing. But we're not talking about digital art today. We're talking about traditional art. So everything that I'm going to talk about from here on out, well, some of it applies to digital art too, but I'm essentially talking about traditional materials. Let's continue on now. Oh, one other reason, I did want to say one other reason why red yellow and blue were primaries is because for centuries it was extremely hard to find good clear um, magenta and cyan pigments. So it was hard for artists for a long time because when they did have those two colors they're also pretty transparent which makes it hard if you're like an, an oil painter which traditionally that was the main medium of choice. You, you had a lot of trouble finding those pigments. However, if you've ever started, you know, People will often say start your watercolor palette with a cool red and a warm red, a cool yellow and a warm yellow, and a cool blue and a warm blue, and you can mix all your colors from there. But if you've actually ever tried that, it's extremely hard to get a bright green or a bright purple. And that's because of the pigment issues that we were just talking about. Um, and because they're not the actual primaries. So sometimes people will tell you to add in a purple or a green as well, but if you do have a cyan and magenta that you like, it's much easier to mix a nice purple and a nice green. Other than picking our color palette, what is color theory good for? Well, I find the main way I use it is to create depth in my paintings. Now this is a, here, let's move my wet paints here. Okay, so this is a painting by Robert S. Duncanson. He was one of the Hudson River uh, Art School painters in America in the 1800s. And what we have here is our nice foreground and then receding mountains in the background. He has created a sense of realistic depth in this artwork. And the question is, how did he do that? So he used color theory to do that. So Beginner artists will often think, okay, well, things get lighter in the background and darker as you come closer into the foreground. And looking at this painting, you would be excused for thinking that. I mean, it that's what it looks like. But that's actually not what's happening. Um, so before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about warm versus cool and saturated versus desaturated. So those are the categories that I use the most when I'm painting, when I'm painting when I'm picking pigments. So the closer an object is, lighter colors will get lighter and darker colors will get darker, but they also get warmer as they're closer to you and cooler as they're farther away. So the question is, why is that? Why, why do lighter colors get lighter and darker colors get darker? Beginner artists always think, okay, well, darker is in the front, lighter is in the back, but that's not necessarily true. And actually, if you zoom in, you will notice that this sleeve here is one of the lightest lights in the whole composition and maybe even lighter than his lightest light here in the back. And that's because white gets whiter as it's closer to you. The farther away an object is in a landscape, it's starting to have atmospheric interference. So now we're going to get a little technical and we're going to talk about chroma, value, tint, shade, and tone. So you don't need to actually know the terms, but you do need to know the theories to have an accurate painting, especially if you're doing anything where there's distance in the background. So let's look at our color wheel again here. So chroma refers to how pure the color is. So this is a high chroma yellow, a high chroma red, and a high chroma blue. You can't get any more yellow than yellow or red or blue. So that is considered a high chroma color. 
the higher the chroma of the color, the closer it is going to appear to the viewer. So the more pure the color, the closer it's going to appear. And that's because as things go back into the distance, they desaturate. That's actually what's happening. The colors are desaturating as you go farther into the distance. Okay, so what does desaturating mean? Well, a lot of people think if I want to desaturate a color here, let's get our paints out and mix again. Ooh, I almost just put my brush in my coffee instead of my water. Who else does that? I bet we all do that. Okay. All right. Um, let's start with, um, let's start with my yellow is a little dirty. I don't really want to use the yellow. Let's use my ultramarine blue. Okay. So we've got a nice clear ultramarine blue, high chroma here. Okay. So here's our regular blue. So if we were painting something blue and we wanted it to, and we wanted to desaturate it, what color do you add to it? So this is where we use our color wheel. So blue is opposite of orange. So you're gonna wanna pick a nice clear orange. And um, I don't have a great orange, but well, this one's pretty good. Let's use our transparent pyro orange and let's add a little to the blue. See how that has immediately come, become sort of a grayish brown color? We desaturated that blue with some orange. I desaturated it maybe a little too much. Let's try mixing it again. Ugh, there's a little bit of white gouache in that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's some blue. And let's add just a dab of the orange. Just a tiny bit of the orange this time. See how that desaturated it? It's a little hard to tell there, but it is a little less blue and even a little more or less blue. So the more, the more of the complementary color you add to the main color, the more desaturated the color gets. So that's one way and the main way <clears throat> that a watercolor artist would use um, mixing pigments to desaturate a color. The other way that a watercolor artist would use to desaturate a color is to just add more water. So here's our, our ultramarine blue again. We're gonna add some clear water to it. And while the chroma or the pureness of the pigment remains the same, it has now become a tint because it's a transparent color. The water is transparent. The white of the paper is allowed to shine through more, which then desaturates the color as a tint. So you can take a main color and desaturate it by adding its complementary color, or you can desaturate it by adding white, and that's called a tint. The other way to desaturate it is by adding black. And I actually don't even, I've got an ivory black, which isn't a neutral black, but we can do it. So let's just put our black here in this middle. And let's desaturate this blue with a touch of the black. So we de desaturated that blue with some black, and that is called a shade. And one place where you can see that really clearly is in pan pastels, and I'm gonna go get mine for a minute so I can show you. Okay, so here are my pan pastels. This is my phthalo blue over here. This is phthalo blue extra dark shade, okay? Here's my magenta up here. This is magenta extra dark shade. This is my chrome, chrome green, I think. This is chrome oxide green. This is the chrome oxide shade. So I don't actually have any tints, but they're labeled as tints. So if I had the lighter phthalo blue, it would be phthalo blue tint because they add white to that. So I can, okay, so Pan Pastels, they use black to, tint, to shade and white to tint. So we can mix those and do that ourselves. So here is the magenta. This is the pure color right here. And we'll wipe that off as best we can. And now we're going to take one end and we're going to mix it with a little black and a little more of the magenta. If you haven't tried pan pastels, this is one of the nice things about them. You can mix them and then put it on your paper. So you can see we're starting to get pretty close to that dark shade here that I have purchased because it's convenient instead of having to mix it all the time. So then if you wanted the magenta tint, 
all you would do is add a little bit of white to it. And this is, I don't have it, but this is pretty close to the magenta tint that you can buy in a pan. And you can do with that with any of their, I think there's 20 pure colors, and then you can make or buy tints and shades by mixing with black or white. So as objects come closer to you in a painting, like we said, the darkers get, the dark colors get darker and the whites get lighter. They also get more saturated in color, so closer to the higher chroma or the purest form of the color that you can get. As you recede into the distance, they desaturate. And if you've ever actually looked at, well, here, let's look at this. So <clears throat> if you, here, actually, maybe I can find a better painting. Okay, so here we have a landscape photo um, by Kim Emsley. And this shows what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So darker in the front, desaturates as you go back. The thing is, as you get farther back in the atmosphere, it will often go to purple before going to a blue that is closer to the blue of the atmosphere. And that's because the farther away an object is, it will take on the blue, same blue color of the sky due to how much atmosphere is between you and the object. But it will often go through a purple phase first at, before it gets to the clear blue of the atmosphere. So if you're painting a landscape and it's not a hazy day and there's mountains in the distance, you're going to want to make sure they go through the purple before blue stage to make sure that it mimics what realistically happens in nature when you are looking at an object in the distance. So the reason that white objects get darker as they're farther back is because of that atmospheric haze. The atmospheric haze has a natural tinge of purple or blue depending on how far away you are. And so the white will take on that purple or blue and purple and blue is darker in value than white. And so the white will become a darker value of white or a shade of white mixed with either purple or blue. And because of that same atmospheric condition, blue is a cool color for the most part. You can have blues that are warm. We'll get into that in color theory. theory. <laughs> we'll get that in, into that in color theory 102. 202? <laughs> we'll get into the blues in color theory 202 because blue is an outlier and there's a problem with it. And I'll talk about that at some point in a few further video. But in general, the farther away an object it is, the more cool it is. And the closer it is to the viewer, the warmer it is. So when we go back to talking about our palette and how we are told to start with a warm blue and a cool blue and a warm yellow and a cool yellow and a warm red and a cool red, that's because if you're mixing a color for an object that's farther away, you're gonna need a cool version of that color. And if you're mixing an object that's closer, you're gonna want a warm version of that color. So we've talked about shade, which is adding black. We've talked about tint, which is adding white. We've talked about desaturation, which is adding the complementary color. And the last word tone is when you add gray. So now I'm gonna talk about the last thing in color theory, which is the use of black in art. I do not almost ever use black when I'm mixing my own colors to desaturate an object or in any of my paintings. So I don't even have a, oh, I know what I could do. So here I have some of my Copic markers. I picked their neutral gray six and their black, which is a neutral black. So here's their black. And here's their neutral gray. Oh no, it's dried up. Here's their neutral gray eight. So there's their neutral gray eight. It's pretty close to black. Okay, so neutral grays and black are not naturally occurring colors in nature. There are a few places, so black is technically the absence of all light and the absence of all color. And in living nature, that color doesn't occur. It does occur in darkness, if you're in a pitch black room or outside when the sky is totally, even then it's hard to, but it's the absence of light. It occurs in minerals like granite, and it will occur in some insects like ants, although that is debated. Anywhere else you see black, like on a black panther or on the black feathers of a black swan, it's not actually black. Um, it's a dark brown, or it's a very dark blue, or it's a very dark green or red. It is not actually black. So when I've talked about using 
black in my work. Um, like I've talked about it when I've used pastels and saying that black is flat. That's because it's not a naturally occurring color in nature, except in those very rare cases that I just mentioned. So if you use black, it's going to look unnatural to our eye because we know that that doesn't occur realistically in nature. And of course, I'm talking about realistic art, which is really what I do. Um, if you're using black in like, you know, a manga drawing to out, that's a whole different, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if we're painting realistic birds or realistic landscapes, um, black doesn't naturally occur in nature. So let's go back over here to our palette. Let's see if we can't mix a color. I mean, we came pretty close here, but let's try to mix a color to make black. So let's add our and I want it pretty dark, so let's add our French Ultramarine. And then, let's add, so this is technically considered a cool blue. So a little tip to make it darker faster is to add a warm opposite color. So let's add a warm red. Is this one more? That's more neutral. Let's try this one, yeah. All right, we're gonna add our warm pyrrole scar scarlet to this ultramarine. I added too much. <laughs> Let's add some more blue. So you can see it's getting darker. It's more of a dark purpley right now. That's with a little yellow, we're getting closer to a brown. So when you want a black, you basically just add all the colors, all the primary colors in your palette. And I am doing the red and the blue because that's how I started when I learned, but I would probably do it differently now if I was going to. So see, here we are very, very close to what looks like black on camera. But if I wipe off my brush and just get some clear water and desaturate it by adding the white of the paper, you can see it's actually more of a bluey purple if you can see that color there. So it looks black when it's thick, but as you desaturate it with the white of the paper and the clear water, like we talked about before, you can see it's actually a bluey purple. Now I would use a color like this for bird feathers or um, a black leopard, panther, everything that I just talked about. If I wanted to add black, I would mix a color like this and use it because it looks more natural to the eye and it won't give your fe your painting a flat feeling or a unlifelike feeling. And it does that because black does not occur in life. So as we talked about, if we're going to do a painting of something like this, we have to desaturate the color as it moves back, but it's up to the artist to pick how you desaturate it. As we talked about, you can desaturate it in multiple ways. You can desaturate it as a tint by adding white. You can desaturate it by adding its complementary color. Or you can desaturate it by adding black, which I almost never do. That's not what I do. I choose not to do that. Now, I do, if you see, have ivory black on my palette and I have Payne's Gray on my palette. But again, these aren't really black. So if we put this Payne's Gray here, as you can see, this is more of a dark, dark blue. And the ivory black here, this is not a neutral black. This is a warm, almost dark brown color, which would be good for, um, like we were just talking about fur and stuff. Although I almost never use ivory black just by itself. I will glaze it other colors over it or I'll mix it with another color, but I, I almost never use ivory black by itself unless I'm doing like a, a nightscape with the moon and I'll use it to do like the surface of the moon, stuff like that. So that is Color Theory 101. And I ho hope you learned something. If you found this video useful and you'd like to see Color Theory 202, please make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. And I can talk more about Color Theory if you're interested in it. And um, like I said, it's Saturday morning. Hopefully I can get this edited and rendered and uploaded before tomorrow morning. <laughs> and until next time, happy creating. Mm -hmm.